Right now, the International Space Station is hurtling at 17,500 miles an hour, 250 miles above the Earth. And in about 10 minutes, we're going to have a live downlink from the International Space Station. We will be talking with NASA astronaut Randy Comrade Bresnik. This, this is, is STEM in 30. 30. Hi, I'm Marty. And I'm Beth. We are coming to you today live from the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery at the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. And we have a whole bunch of students here today, both in the gallery and in the IMAX theater. Here in the Moving Beyond Earth Gallery with us, we have the sixth graders from Providence Elementary School. Welcome, guys. <laughs> And in the IMAX theater, we have the Washington Aero Club, which introduces students to careers in the aerospace industry. We also have a whole bunch of students around the country tuning in and watching today. Some of them have submitted video questions, which we will see later in the show. Now, earlier this summer, we had a chance to visit Randy Comrade Bresnik in Houston. Yeah, we went down there and filmed a series of videos called ISS Science. These videos include Randy talking about what it's like to live and work on the International Space Station, a hands-on classroom-friendly demo, and a lesson plan so that teachers can extend the learning in their classrooms. Let's take a look at the first episode of ISS Science, which will show you how to spot the station from your own backyard. Hello, I'm astronaut Randy Bresnik. Here's my friends Marty and Beth. Randy will be headed to the International Space Station where he will spend six months in low Earth orbit. While he is there, he will become the first Marine commander of the International Space Station. And while I'm up there, Beth and Marty will be bringing you periodic updates as to what we're doing. We're gonna take those updates and tie them into specific lesson plans that you can use in your classroom. You can literally go outside in your backyard and say hello to Randy while he's up there working. You can spot the ISS as it's passing over. You just need to know when and where to look. Here's how you can spot the International Space Station from your backyard. And please be sure to wave. We can spot the International Space Station from our backyard, and all that we need to know is when and where to look. Let's start by going to the NASA website, spotthestation.nasa.gov. This will give us all the information we need. Now, let's try to spot the station. We see on this pass, the station will become visible at north, northwest at 8.32 p.m. Let's be sure we are on time because the space station won't wait. First, let's use our compass to find west. Now find north. Northwest is between north and west. North, northwest is between northwest and north. Okay, got it. Next, we see it's going to disappear in the east. Got that location. The entire visible pass will happen between those two areas. Now we have to determine how high it's going to be. Height is measured in degrees. There's a simple way to determine this height. Hold your hand out away from your body and make a fist. If you place the bottom of your fist on the horizon, that line where the sky meets the ground, the top of your fist will be approximately 10 degrees. You can then stack your fists on top of each other to reach 20, 30, 40 degrees or higher. Tonight, the space station will appear at 10 degrees north-northwest. If I place one fist in front of me while looking north-northwest, this is where it should first become visible. Got it. It will disappear at 20 degrees east right there. At its highest point, it will reach 40 degrees. Bingo. 
We now have a good idea of the approximate path that the space station will be traveling along. It's almost time. Let's look in the general direction of where the pass will become visible. We will scan a wider area in case we are a little off with our measurements. The station does not have lights outside that are visible from Earth. When we see it, we are actually seeing the sun reflecting off of it. Once the station becomes visible, it will take about six minutes to pass across the sky. It will not blink like an airplane. It will look like a very bright star that is traveling very fast across the sky. Here it comes. Wave to the astronauts. While we were in Houston, we actually got a chance to do a lot of different things. Beside working with uh, Comrade Bresnik on filming some things, we got a chance to see him do some virtual reality training, which to me was one of the scariest things I've ever seen because even though he was just sitting in a chair with these goggles on, they rehearsed what would happen if he drifted away from the International Space Station. And so he did this emergency procedure where he flew himself back and grabbed on and you could see him reach out. But just the thought of that is incredibly scary. And in October, he will actually be doing um, two or three spacewalks. The other thing that was neat to see when we went to Johnson uh, Space Center was they have a Saturn V rocket. Now, this is the rocket that was used during the Apollo missions to get the astronauts to the moon and back. And it's huge, but what's incredible is that there's only a tiny little part that comes, actually comes back. Yeah, we're about one minute from uh, getting the signal from the International Space Station. The, the crazy part about that rocket is that um, it's a huge rocket, but the, the command module would fit here on the stage in, in this gallery. And the Apollo 11 command module is getting ready to go to Space Center Houston. And what's neat about that is that the Apollo 11 command module was the module that brought the first astronauts who walked on the moon back. But at Space Center Houston, they also have Apollo 17 command module, which was the last command module to bring uh, astronauts back so you can get to see the first and the last. It's the only time you get to see two of them in the same building. It's it's really, really cool. Um, all right, we're getting really close to the downlink starting, so we should be seeing mission control real quick. <laughs> Station, this is Marty Kelsey and Beth Wilson, the hosts of STEM and 30. How do you hear me? Marty and Beth, got you loud and clear. Hi, comrade. We are really excited to be talking with you today. We have 650 students joining us, raring to go, and Beth has a question before we get started. I wanted to know, now that you are fully staffed up again, how are things going on the station? Things are going great. Uh, the new crew, Joe and Mark, showed up, ready to go, and we have been uh, working hard ever since. We sent a dragon home with a whole bunch of science and a whole bunch of equipment, uh, stuff that'll, you know, for all the work that we did up here and sending back the, the uh, uh, different experiments. We've then been working on getting ready for an EVA. Joe just planted some lettuce, not one, but three kinds of lettuce yesterday. Uh, so we're really getting going on the science up here. So it's a really exciting time to be up on the space station. Welcome aboard. Are you being what you wanted to be in high school? Um, in high school, I was always am amazed by airplanes, and I always thought that uh, I wanted to be a pilot and fly. And so I got really fortunate to be able to go to college and um, become a pilot in the Marine Corps. And so I thought that was, you know, that was the best as it, that it could be. And I became an F-18 pilot and a test pilot. And look, now I'm flying. It's just now I'm 250 miles up instead of 25,000 feet in the air. Hi, my name is Luke Buckley, and is it hard to move around the space station? Is it easy to move around? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> what do you think? You can also float around. So do you think 
Pretty easy to move around. Hi, my name is Karis. Can you watch TV and YouTube in space? We can watch TV. We, they send us up TV and movies and we can watch it on a computer. We also have a big screen that we can go ahead and watch movies on Friday night. Uh, YouTube, the internet, that is a capability that's here, but there is so much neat, interesting stuff going on up here. I haven't taken the time to look at any, any YouTube stuff. I'll save that for when I get back on the ground and I don't have the magnificent view of Earth that we have up here. Hi, my name is Emily. My question is, how does water act in space? That is a great question. Why don't we find out? Here's one of our drink bags. This is apple cider, all right? We have to have a lock on the straw, otherwise the water would come out. Now on Earth, like when it rains, your rain jacket or the window on your car, the water doesn't just fall off, right? It kind of, some of it sticks and you'll see droplets. Even though gravity would normally be pulling it down, you'll see droplets on windows, right? Because surface tension of the water holds it in place. Well, we'll show you what surface tension does up here. The water all sticks to itself and forms a bubble. And so when we exercise, the water just sticks all over our face and we have to wipe it off with a towel. You gotta be careful not to shake your head too far, otherwise the water goes flinging off. My name is Delaney and I was wondering, when do you know what time you need to go to bed? Another good question. We don't know when it's time to go to bed because the sun goes down 16 times every, uh, 16 times a day for us. So we have to use our watches to tell us when it's time to go to bed. Same thing, you don't, you don't wake up when the sun comes up because that happens 16 times too. So we use our watches to tell us when it's go to bed. We have a, a work day, we have exercise. Um, and then usually we get to bed with a little bit of time to brush our teeth, call home, write emails, watch a little TV, and then we go to sleep and get ready to start the next day. Hi, I'm Marilena. What do you do in your free time in space? Well, I already mentioned we've got this amazing blue marble underneath us that we're going around six, uh, 16 times a day or six miles every second is what we're covering over the ground. And it's really beautiful. So in my free time, this is what I like to do. Take pictures because the view up here is amazing and the colors are so different. And every time you go around, the clouds are different. And there's different things. Um, whether a city's in darkness or whether it's in light um, and different seasons. And so it's just amazing for us to be able to have the opportunity to see our beautiful planet. We wish all of you could see it like this because it is really amazing and you really feel humbled by the opportunity to see our beautiful planet from this point of view. Hi, Randy. My name is Roy, and I was wondering what happens if someone gets sick? That's a good question because your body, your whole life has been in gravity. And when you get up to zero gravity, sometimes it doesn't feel so good. So we have special bags called emesis bags that we have in case somebody feels sick. Because you saw the water droplet a minute ago, right? Well, imagine if you get sick, now that stuff goes everywhere. And so we have a special bag. This part in the middle it's just like an, a bag on an airline. It's a bag to collect what happens when you get sick. But because the stuff floats, you can do what you have to on the inside, and then you got a nice little cloth attached so you can wipe your face. Then you can just stuff it inside. And so now you got everything inside the white bag, the cloth inside. You turn your bag inside out. You do up the Ziploc, and you throw it away. You have no mess and no smell. Works really good. Hi, my name is Amina. How do you cope with missing your family?
That's tough, because I have a, a seven-year-old daughter and an 11-year-old son, you know, second grade, and uh, just started middle school, sixth grade. Um, and obviously my wife, uh, who I've been married to for, for 14 years now, and I, I miss them a lot. You know, it, it's, it's, it is hard. Um, but just like, you know, military people who serve overseas, or it's people in the State Department, or, you know, places where, you know, we're not be able to be at home, um, you find ways. You know, you communicate via email is really a nice way to stay in touch. Um, sending pictures back and forth. And then fortunately nowadays we have an internet protocol phone that I can just hop on. Anytime we have satellite coverage, I can call down to Earth, anywhere on Earth, any phone number, and talk to people. And the communication is so good after it leaves the space station, goes to satellites, back down to the ground, and then through this phone system, that it sounds like I am down on the Earth using a cell phone. And so that's a really good way. And then for uh, uh, those of us up here, we also have weekly conferences with video, kind of like Skype, that we can actually see our families and talk to them. So that really makes it seem, makes it seem not so far away. So it's really, really good in that regard. Hi, my name is Riley, and I was wondering, what do you do on a normal day basis? Well, I don't know if you can, uh, how much you can see in here, but we've got robotics workstations, we've got cameras, we've got experiments off to the side here, we've got an exercise device, um, we've got experiments in cold, uh, in uh, a thing called polar, which is like a refrigerator. Um, we do science, where we go ahead and work in glove boxes, we work in science that involves stuff that we do with metals and fire and fluids, uh, we've got experiment racks all over the space station that we go ahead and use. We do exercise two and a half hours a day where we're lifting weights or running or bicycling um, to be able to keep our bodies strong because when we're up here not using our muscles, our bones lose density and that's not good. And our bodies age like someone who's probably in their 90s, someone with osteoporosis. So we got to combat that. Um, we also spend time doing outreach and stuff to kids like you so that hopefully when we show you all this cool stuff that's out there for science, all the stuff, all this technology that we're developing to make all this possible in Zilgabrick, all the engineering that goes into how do we build a space station made by all these different countries in places all over the world with such exacting engineering and manufacturing techniques that we assemble it for the first time in space and it all fits and it all works. And then obviously for me, I was a math major, you know, everything has to do with math. You know, you're always using math to figure stuff out, whether it's the problems or the schedule or whatever it is. So this is just a working example of what science, technology, engineering, and math, you know, is. And so hopefully you guys see this and go, wow, that looks like really interesting stuff. I want to learn more about that. Hi, I'm Kaylee. What was it like to see the solar eclipse from the space station? Hey, Kaylee, that, would, that was pretty amazing. Um, it, there was this big, dark, black shadow uh, on top of the clouds and the Earth that moved along. And I think we were all impressed about how big it was. And because we're used to seeing the scale up here from 250 miles, and to see something that big, you know, bigger than, you know, like the state of Rhode Island, you know, I think is what it was. And see it move along was just really, really neat and impressive. And that was the, just the, the shadow on the ground, looking up at the sun and seeing the slivers, and seeing the sliver you know, grow and expand um, with the special solar filters we had on our cameras was really neat as well. Um, I, I hope that you got to see it, because I know that my kids certainly thought that, that was pretty amazing. And, and to have a full solar eclipse like that across the United States for the first time in almost 100 years was a really special event. I hope you'll remember it. Hi, my name is Giselle. What does weather look like from space? Weather looks really neat. Um, we get to see the clouds and we get to see the lightness, light in the dark. Um, and so the neat thing about clouds is they're no two the same. They're different everywhere. And you could see where you, know, you would think that they would all be the same because it'd be the same kind of weather pattern, but you'd have a, a line of clouds and then some puffies and then some streaks and things like that. So that's always amazing to see. It's inter neat how they can kind of make patterns on the grounds, how you can see the shadows of the clouds. Um, we have unfortunately seen way too many hurricanes from up here in the past uh, past couple weeks. Um, but to see the hurricane swirls and the way the clouds jet out from the edges and then look down literally into the eye of the hurricane to see some calm clouds in the middle and actually we've seen straight down to the blue of the ocean inside the middle of, of Irma and uh, Jose. So it's, 
um, you know, very interesting to see. The sad part for us is just knowing what's going on on the ground underneath uh, the, those hurricanes. Hi, my name is Alice, and does food taste different in space? Food does taste different. Um, I think for most of us, the tastes aren't quite as strong. So we try and you know, add sauces and things like that to our food. We have different kinds of food up here. We got food that kind of comes in pouches, you know, and then it lasts for a long time. Um, we have food that comes um, freeze dried. And so what we do is we add water in through here. We let it sit for a few minutes and it's really light. Um, this is zero gravity, so. But if you were holding it in your hand, it would feel about, you know, maybe a couple feathers weight. So it's, that's a really easy way to get stuff up to the space station to us. And we just have to add the water. We have foodie cans. Like here's a little bit of dessert. And then we have other things for dessert. And I think you guys know what those are. So you gotta be careful though, because They float around. And then they'll stop moving, and then you touch it, they'll react and start moving around again. And we'll see if we can get this right. Here is a candy coated peanut coming to you. Tastes pretty good. My name is Eric. When you eat, does the food float inside your mouth or does it stay on your tongue like it does on Earth? Um, the food. Um, sticks to your mouth because your mouth has the water like we talked about with surface tension. So kind of like the way that the, uh, the, uh, M the candies are, are sticking to the outside here, um, it sticks in your mouth once you get it there. It's from the getting it from the package to your mouth that's the hard part. Um, you got to make sure that it, you know, you kind of uh, float it towards your mouth and you can use your spoon to kind of make sure it gets there. Hi, my name is Anna. Are there things that you can't bring on this space station? Well, just like a airplane or a ship or things like that, one of the things that you worry about um, always is fire. And so certainly things that are flammable, we don't want up here. We don't want things that are sharp because you can, you know, we're, we're floating around and moving around. We don't, you know, sometimes we bump into stuff. And so we don't want to go ahead and have anything that could hurt us in that regard. Um, let's see, we don't want to have things that take too much energy because right now we're collecting energy from the solar arrays. Um, and so we're going to have stuff that's efficient. And certainly not anything that's dangerous that if it gets out of the package that causes any harm to us because we're circulating the air up here kind of like a submarine does. And we can't just open the window and get fresh air. So those are the kinds of things that we, that we don't want to have here on Space Station. Hi, my name is Ashley. How does it feel when going and launching into space? That's a really neat thing because you've got rockets that weigh um, you know, maybe a million pounds, but they have a million and a half pounds of thrust or the power from the engines to allow you to escape Earth's gravity. And so you're sitting in your seat, you're in your spacesuit, it launches, it rumbles, and then all of a sudden you're pushed back into the seat as the vehicle accelerates away from the Earth. And so, kind of like you, if you've been in a car or a roller coaster, when you, when you start out and it really pulls you along, you kind of push back into the seat. But that roller coaster or that car or even an airplane on takeoff, when you're pushed back to the seat, that acceleration that pushes you in the seat stops after a while because the car or the airplane or the roller coaster don't have enough power to keep accelerating. The amazing thing is it takes eight and a half minutes to get to orbit. And that whole time you're accelerating under this rocket power. And so you're used to maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds of acceleration on these other things I talked about on Earth. But when you get into minutes of acceleration, your body's going, wait a minute, how, 
how could this thing be this powerful? We're still accelerating. So it's a really neat feeling and amazing that engineering-wise, we as humans have been able to develop this rocket technology uh, to be able to get off of Earth. And now we're developing even bigger rockets and better rockets allow to go farther places in the solar system. So that's a really exciting time, especially for you guys who are getting ready to you know, move up in level in school. You guys could be the ones that are designing those types of rockets and flying those rockets. Hi, my name is Mia, and do your ears pop in space? Normally they don't, because our rocket ships and our space stations at the same pressure that you're at at the Space Air and Space Museum. 14.7, um, you know, pounds per square inch, that's sea level pressure. And so, if our ears pop, then that's one of two things are happening. Either we're getting ready to go on an EVA because we our pressure on our suits is a little lower, or we've had a depress event where we have a hole in the space station and we're losing atmosphere. So that one we definitely don't want to have. Um, we're getting ready to go head on some spacewalks next week, so we'll, we'll actually have that happen a little bit when we get inside our suits to go outside. Um, because that 14.7 PSI that we are at right now on space station, inside the spacesuits we actually go down to, to 4.2 PSI. What that means is that's the same thing as being at about 30,000 feet. So taller than Mount Everest is the pressure that we're in inside our suits. So we can go out there and still move in our suits. How we function at the taller than Mount Everest elevation, we, do, we use oxygen, 100%. Comrade, we want to thank you so much for talking with us today. This has been absolutely incredible. We hope you enjoy the rest of your time on space. And uh, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> wow! That is incredible! Thank you, comrade. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, guys. Thanks for coming. Great questions, and uh, enjoy the rest of your time at the National Air and Space Museum. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. We would like to thank Comrade thank you Bresnik. To all the participants that from was the absolutely NASA. amazing. Uh, and we'd also like to thank all the folks from NASA for helping make this possible. We also want to thank our uh, sponsor today, uh, Boeing. And tonight, if you live in the Washington, D.C. area, you can go out into your backyard and see the International Space Station pass over. Early this evening, it'll be making a really bright, really visible pass right over the Washington, D.C. area. Make sure you go outside and check it out. And don't forget to wave. Thanks for Thanks. watching.